Well, good morning, everyone. This is August Rosado with Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries, and we want to thank you so much for tuning in. On this Wednesday morning, we're in the middle of the week. It is February 21st, 2018, coming to you live from my main headquarters here in Lincoln, Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, it was only maybe three or four days ago, we got about six to eight inches of snow up here in New England. And then just yesterday, we got almost 70 degree weather. And today, we're going to have another warm spell of nearly 70 degrees. And so the weather up here in New England can be batty to say the least, but I'm one of those warm weather type guys, so I'll take it any way that I can get it, but uh, all that snow that we got is gone, so praise the Lord for that, and uh, we know that uh, it's going to get warmer out there, March is right around the corner, and so before you know it, baseball's in full swing, and so we have William Wilson with us today, Bruce Roberts, Van Carter, we have Danny Edwards, Greg A. Dixon, and it uh, looks like we've got quite a few preachers. They look like preachers to me. And uh, we have uh, Melissa Oler uh, with us. I believe that is Timmy Oler's wife. And so it is great to have all of you in the room with us this morning. Thank you so much, especially for you men of God that take time out of your busy schedules. I know what the life of a preacher can be like. And so <clears throat> I, I want to thank all of you. For taking time out of your schedule to join us as we come to you Tuesday through Friday for our Bible prophecy update. Now, we used to do it Monday through Friday, but we're taking Mondays off because when I preach on Sundays, you know, you know for some reason, we preachers love to take Mondays off. And so and it's a time to recover, you know, recover your uh, voice box and all that stuff, give your vocal cords a rest. But uh, we come to you Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, and then on Friday is our Friday Prophecy Q&A, and that uh, gives you an opportunity to put me on the hot seat as I try to answer your Bible prophecy questions. If I can't answer it, well, I just can't answer it, you know, but I will try to answer it based on the authority of the Word of God, and so uh, that's on Friday. It's Friday Prophecy Q&A. We're on for one hour, and so if you're new here, uh, to the room. Again, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And I know your schedules, especially for preachers, are pretty busy, but thank you so much for uh, tuning in this morning. Remember, these uh, live video streams are public. That means anybody can watch them, whether they're a Facebook friend of mine or not. Anybody can watch the live stream. And, uh, you know, when I was at church uh, last Sunday night, uh, one of the deacons of our, in our church approached me because we're, up, we're coming up on our Bible prophecy conference at my home church, the Greater Rhode Island Baptist Temple in Johnson. Once a year, they asked me to preach a prophecy conference, even though we're only going to do it for one day this year. Upcoming on March the 4th, we're going to try to live stream that conference for you. You can listen live audio, but we're going to also try to live video stream it as well, and one of our deacons approached me, really dear brother in the Lord, and he says, uh, Brother August, you know, during the prophecy conference, is there any way that you could probably hit up on the topic of the problem of the emergent church? And I said, well, we already have the topics in order. That's not to say I might not hit up on it a little bit here and there, but, you know, we already got our topics in order, you know, concerning the rapture, the tribulation period, and the millennial kingdom. And so we already have those topics in order. But now we're going to probably look at another day to have me preach on this subject. But it just keeps being brought up to me because it is a major issue here in America how mainline churches are getting caught up in the uh, dark doctrines of the Emergent Church. And that's the reason why I titled today's lesson, The Emergent Ecumenical Endangerment. I love using alliteration. <laughs> the Emergent Ecumenical Endangerment. 
And I and even some independent fundamental Baptist churches are getting caught up in this stuff. So uh, that's the reason why I want to talk about this today. I noticed that Christy Cramper is watching. That means my associate pastor, Pastor Tom Cramper, is watching. So great to have you guys watching today. Michael Popes is uh, watching. Uh, Dr. Todd Baker, he's here. Front, <laughs> he says, I'm here front and center. And I, 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 I want to give, um, you know, credit to Dr. Baker because he helped me out with this. He sent me uh, the information concerning this very dangerous movement that's going on uh, in America today. And we're pretty much throwing off the baby with the bathwater. And, folks, we, we need to recognize how dangerous this movement really is. So we're going to get to that in just a few moments. But great to see Dr. Baker. And, by the way, Todd Baker and I are going to be leaving for Israel next month, March 11th through the 20th. And uh, we're going to be in Israel for 10 days. Well, what are we going to be doing in Israel? Touring? No, soul winning. That's right. We're going to be soul winning. Todd and I are going out there to share the gospel with the Jewish people and the Arab people as we usually do when we go out there. And I'm looking at my case of Bibles, Hebrew Bibles, all the New Testament. Uh, that was sent to us by Beans Bible uh, Ministry out there in Gulfport, Mississippi, dear friends of mine. They sent Todd his Bibles, and we're going to be going to Israel. And we're going to be heading to malls in Netanya, malls in the Galilee, malls in Jerusalem, wherever the Lord opens the doors. And we're going into those malls. And we're going to be going one-on-one -on -one and sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. I need all of you to please keep that date in mind, March 11th through the 20th. That's next month. Todd Baker and I will be leaving for the Holy Land. After our day of evangelism, Todd and I uh, usually pick out a biblical spot uh, every day there in Israel, and we will teach on that location, as we usually do. Todd and I, we've taught. My goodness, Todd, I mean, we've taught at so many biblical sites in Israel. We, we were just recently at Jericho this past October. Todd and I taught at Jericho. Todd and I taught at the tomb of Lazarus in Bethany. And Christian tour groups won't even go to Bethany because it's an Arab village. So what? <clears throat> Todd and I drove in there just opposite the Mount of Olives, on the western side of the Mount of Olives. And we went to the opposite side, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Mount of Olives. Todd and I went into this Arab village. We asked where Bethany was. They told us just right up the road. We went up the road. We parked, went up the road. And I saw this orange sign that said in Hebrew, Chaver Lazarus, tomb of Lazarus. And we uh, went in there, walked down these flight of steps, went into this ancient tomb. We talked right there, the tomb of Lazarus. And we go to all types of different locations, and we upload these videos uh, to Facebook, uh, to YouTube. And you can go to my YouTube page. I have over 250 videos on YouTube. So you can go, and you can check out all of our videos of all of our Bible teaching from Israel, uh, Rome. Todd and I were in Rome teaching Bible prophecy out there. Uh, and also my Bible prophecy teaching from Petra in southern Jordan. So you can go to my YouTube page, August Rosado, on YouTube. Check all of my uh, videos out. Again, um, I, I reached my 5,000 friend limit on Facebook. It took like nine years. Can you imagine that? Nine years to get to 5,000 friends. So I'm not sure if I can take any more friend requests. It might maybe squeeze one or two in there, but I, I have reached my 5,000 friend limit on um, Facebook. But my page is public in these videos. Are public and we also upload uh, these videos uh, for you to watch later on if you can't stick around for a long period of time to watch the one hour segment that we have and I also upload a lot of my late breaking news stories on Twitter I have a Twitter account my handle is August Rosado at Bible underscore prophecy and so you can go to my uh, Twitter account if you have a Twitter account follow me on Twitter or you can create a free Twitter account, or just go to my account and look at all of my late-breaking uh, news stories coming from Israel, the Middle East, the European Union, all over the world. 
as we believe that these events are set on the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled in the not too distant future. And if you happen to live in Rhode Island, whether it's Providence, uh, Johnston, Lincoln, or Woonsocket, don't forget to join us in person for our Bible prophecy conference. And that will be on March the 4th, and it's going to be at my home church, the Greater Rhode Island Baptist Temple in Johnston. I will be teaching Sunday school as well as preaching the 11 a.m. service as well as the 6 p.m. service. So if you live uh, in the area, we'd love to have you join us at the Greater Rhode Island Baptist Temple, March the 4th, for our annual Bible Prophecy Conference. And then, of course, shortly after that, Dr. Todd Baker and I will be leaving for uh, Israel. And, and, again, you know, we've been making the plea out there. Todd's been making the plea on his Facebook page. I've been making the plea on my Facebook page uh, that we need your financial support, and we need your help with this. Now, let me just clarify something here. Our airfare is covered. Our hotels are covered. Our food is covered. We don't need any help with that. That's all taken care of. That's all paid for. What we need help with is car rental expense and gas expense. To rent the car in Israel as well as to pay for the gas. Gas is very pricey in Israel. They're almost at like $6.50, almost $7 a gallon. Wow, can you imagine if we were paying $7 a gallon here in America? I mean, it would be outright rebellion right now. But that's what they pay because the Arabs won't sell to the, to, to the Israelis. So they have to get their gas from secondary sources. So gas is pretty pricey out there in uh, Israel. We need your help with that, folks. We need your prayers first and foremost, and we need your financial support to help with car rental expense and with uh, gas expenses. No gift too big or too small to help us reach the Jewish people with the good news of the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus, the Messiah. You know, Paul said in Romans 1, 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We'll go into Israel, as we usually do, and we're going to be sharing the gospel with the Jewish people, going one-on-one -on -one with them, getting the word of God into their hands. And so we need your help with that, folks. Can you please uh, prayerfully consider send in a donation to Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries. You can do that. Again, there's no gift too big or too small, ladies and gentlemen. You can do that by going to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Uh, hit the Donate button at the bottom of the webpage, and then you can go there, and you can hit that Donate button, put whatever amount the Lord lays on your heart. Let me just see what Kathy Bolton She said, keep. Please keep our singing group singing for the Lord in prayer. We are just waiting on God to open up doors for us to share God's word through music. We love doing the old gospel hymns. We are loaded on uh, YouTube and on Instagram. For those that would like to listen, we thank you in advance for your prayers. We'll pray, uh, Kathy Bogan, that God will open the doors for you there. Speaking of Kathy Bogan, she lives in Lorraine, Ohio. I'm going to be preaching at her church, a four-day prophecy conference at her church in Lorraine, Ohio. So we're looking forward to that, Lord willing, in uh, April. I know that many have come into the room right now, like a like a Renato Tanaje Sion. I hope I got that right. Great to have you there. And Samuel Cruz, Joshua Spears, Lori Manis. Good morning to you, Stephen Mitch Smith, a friend of ours out there in Mississippi. And um, if I missed you, I apologize. I love to give recognition to those who come into the room and um, watch live. We appreciate all of you uh, coming and spending time with us. So again, folks, uh, we need uh, uh, your your financial support to help us there in Israel. So you can hit the donate button at the bottom of my webpage, todayinbibleprophecy.org. And you can also mail your support to Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries, 55 Pleasant Street, Apartment 2, Lincoln, Rhode Island, 02865. Again, let me reiterate, there is no gift too big and there's no gift too small. Help us in this endeavor to get the gospel to the Jewish people there in Israel. You know, Paul said in Romans 10, 1, he says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. You know, I, I reject John Hagiism. 
you know, that we shouldn't be evangelizing Jews. They're automatically saved because they keep the Mosaic Covenant. They're automatically saved because they're the physical descendants of Abraham. So we don't need to be reaching Jews. They're automatically saved. He believes in that dual covenant theology nonsense, that there are two salvations, a salvation for the Jew outside of Jesus and a salvation for the Gentile in Jesus. That is right from the pits of hell, ladies and gentlemen. There is only one salvation for the Jew, and there's only one salvation for the Gentile, and that is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So I reject dual covenant theology, and I reject John Hagee's stance that Jews are automatically saved. Well, if that's the case, then why did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 10 and verse number 6, I go to the saved sheep of the house of Israel or the lost sheep? of the house of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The Jews need the gospel. They're in a state of unbelief, and it's been like that for nearly two years since they rejected Jesus in the first century and still reject him today. Dr. Todd Baker and I go to Israel, and we go out there as shalachim, uh, emissaries, if you will. We go there to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus with Jews and with Arabs as well. We don't leave the Arabs out. Uh, I remember witnessing to a guy named uh, Wali. Uh, he was at the uh, ruins of Magdala, where Mary Magdalene was from, right there near the Sea of Galilee. And uh, we ended up giving him a Bible. We were sharing the gospel with him. And he was very grateful. He took it and he said, you know, thank you so, so very much. And so we just don't give him a Bible and say, really, have a good day. No, we share the gospel with them. We give them the plan of salvation and give them that opportunity to get saved. You know, sharing the gospel in Israel is way different than I, as you do it here in America. You just can't use the terms out here, you know, out there that we use here in America. It's totally different. And so you have to approach it delicately when you're out there. It's not illegal. Israel's a democracy. It's, it's legal to share the gospel uh, out there. You have freedom of religion out there in Israel, but it's still a very delicate. Uh, situation and so but God has opened many many doors for us and so uh, if you can please help us out with a donation that would be greatly appreciated whether it's 5, 10, 15, 50, 100 doesn't matter there's no gift too big or too small to help <clears throat> in sharing the gospel there in Israel again the dates are March 11th through the 20th when Dr. Baker and I are out there in Israel and if you've never been to Israel if you've always wanted to go to the Holy Land and discover the Jewish roots of your Christian faith to see what Bible prophecy will be fulfilled in the not too distant future. Then I invite you to come to Israel with me. We have a date set in June, June 6th through the 15th, with an option to Petra. And we would love to have you come with us for 11 days, walking in the footsteps of Jesus, seeing where Bible prophecy will be fulfilled. Going to Israel is like walking onto a stage. The actors are long gone, but the props are still there. And I want you to see those props. I want you to see where Bible prophecy will be fulfilled in the not too distant future. So when you have an opportunity, if you'd like to come with us, or if you want more information, get a hold of me on Facebook Messenger or email me, august.todayinbibleprophecy at gmail.com or contact me through my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. We have a contact form on there where you can contact us. If you're a pastor of a good, solid, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing church, and you would like to have me come to your church to talk about Israel, Bible prophecy, and current events, then I would love to come to your church. Again, contact me and let me know if there's a date you have in mind for 2018. We would love to come to your church to talk about these biblical truths, just like we do every single day here on Facebook live stream and so i got a call from a um a pastor in the united kingdom london can you imagine that and uh, he said august i want to get you into a lot of churches out here in the united kingdom he says plan on staying for a month here in the united kingdom i've never been to london before he says plan on staying out here because i have a lot of churches out here that would love to listen to what you have to say concerning eschatology the doctrine of last things, the study of the end times. And so I was excited about that. You know, I'm like, yeah, I mean, uh, we've never been to the United Kingdom. 
before, that would be a great opportunity to go out there for, for the month and preach at churches uh, all around the area. So that, that would be a, a blessing. They're already getting flyers set up, and they've already contacted the churches. And so that's, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a topic that permeates one-third of the Word of God. 33% of the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, deals with Bible prophecy. <clears throat> From Daniel chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. There are 400 of 1,189 chapters in the Bible that deal with Bible prophecy. And it's something we shouldn't be ignoring. You know, it, Revelation 1.3, Blessed is he that read it, they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, I'd love to come to your church and talk about these prophetic truths from a plain sense interpretation because if the plain sense makes sense don't look for any other sense or you will end up with nonsense and when it comes to bible prophecy there is a lot of nonsense out there <clears throat> and if you know me guys you've been listening to me for a long period of time right now you know very well i don't deal with hype i don't deal with drama and I don't deal with sensationalism. I just want to teach and preach the plain sense interpretation of Bible prophecy. That's it. You can go on YouTube and get all that lousy YouTube eschatology, you know, or what we would call the post-prophetic paradigm. You know, where this is nothing more than science fiction eschatology that you get on YouTube from these so-called prophecy teachers today. The Nephilim eschatology, UFO <clears throat> uh, eschatology. You know, you get all this nonsense on YouTube. You don't get that with me, and I do not associate my ministry with any of those other guys that do so. I just want to preach the plain sense interpretation of Bible prophecy to apply a proper biblical hermeneutic. Who's speaking? Who is he speaking to? What is he speaking about? That's a rule of thumb with hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is a science of biblical interpretation. I don't eisegete the text. I'm not putting my own thoughts and my own ideas into the biblical text and, and saying, this is what I think it ought to say. No. I exegete the text. I'm drawing the meaning out of the text and then presenting that meaning to you as the Bible intends it to me. That's it. That's what you get with us. No more, no less. And so that's what I want to do, folks. As a, as a student of 30 years, almost 30 years, as a student of Bible prophecy, I just want to teach and preach to you the plain sense interpretation of Bible prophecy. And that's it. So we we'll have more to say after the broadcast, and it's about 1124 right now and so what i'd like to invite you to do is i want you to take your bibles and and again remember folks i always encourage you i always encourage you that when you join us every day tuesday through friday have your bible <clears throat> on hand have bible in hand take down some notes or later on later on you can um Look at the archive of the show. But I want to direct your attention to Revelation chapter number two, if you will, please. Uh, Revelation uh, chapter number two. And I want you to look with me in verse number 14. The message that Jesus has is to the church at Pergamos. And uh, many would look at uh, Pergamos as the state church. The church run by the state a secular church with secular doctrine humanistic doctrine and jesus had a problem with this church out of all the seven churches he only commends two of those churches smyrna the persecuted church they were being persecuted for their faith and the church of philadelphia the spiritually alive church, the church that was preaching right doctrine. 
But the other five churches, Jesus had a major problem with them. But when we get to the church at, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Pergamos, he says in verse 14, But I have a few things against thee. Jesus says, I have a problem with you. But I have a few things against thee. Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Whoa, Jesus said, I hate their doctrine. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Jesus says, I have a problem with this church because they were teaching a false doctrine. The church of Pergamos was warned by the Lord Jesus not to tolerate the false teachers within that were desensitizing the congregation to sin. They were desensitizing the congregation to holy living, righteous living, desensitizing the congregation to the need of evangelism, to win people to the Lord, desensitizing the congregation to the importance of the inerrancy of the word of God. The word of God was being second-guessed and becoming subjective. And we see that that's a major problem that's going on, ladies and gentlemen, in the church today. Jesus said this church at Pergamos, they were teaching the doctrine of Balaam. We know what Balaam tried doing to the children of Israel. The story is out of Numbers chapter 31 and verse number 16. And then, of course, Peter talks about what happened in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15. And in Jude, verse number 11, as well as Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 14. Balaam caused Israel to stumble spiritually. False teachers in the church today are causing many within mainline Christianity to stumble. Why? By failing, ladies and gentlemen, by failing to teach the inspired an errant, authoritative word of the living God. Rather than reading the word of God objectively, they're looking at it subjectively, and they're second-guessing the Bible. They're second-guessing the doctrine of the Bible, desensitizing the people today. And this is, again, a major problem that is going on in the church. Now, there was a group in the New Testament called the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans, well, Nicolaitans simply means those who are followers of Nicholas. It also means one who conquers the people. It's the one who wants the preeminence in the church, just like the Atrophies. The Atrophies wanted the preeminence. He did not want the focus to be on Jesus and Jesus alone. The Atrophies wanted the focus to be on him. Whenever you see these guys on TV, especially Christian TV, you notice that they always want the focus on them. It's all about them. They want to be the center of attention. That's what I call a Diotrophies spirit. They want it to be about them and them alone. And when you look at these individuals that want all the attention on them, all the focus on them, it's a diatrophy spirit. You need to hightail and get away from such individuals. Now, these Nicolaitans, and Jesus mentions them twice in Revelation 2.6 and Revelation 2.15. Who were the Nicolaitans? Well, they were a libertine 
antinomian sect within the church. And these guys were absolutely spiritually dangerous. They were a dangerous, dangerous sect. Now, libertine simply means one who behaves without moral principles. That's a libertine sect right there. They were antinomian. Antinomian are those who believe that grace gives them a license to do whatever they want. Grace gives them a license to sin. If you think for a moment that grace gives you a license to do whatever you want, that grace gives you a license to sin, my advice to you is that you better check your salvation out. Because if you're truly saved and born again and under the grace of God, you don't have a desire to do the things that you once did. But if you claim you're saved, you claim you're a Christian, and you're still doing those worldly desires, you better double check your salvation on that. But that's what this group was doing. This group who called themselves the Nicolaitan. Look with me again in verse number six. Jesus said, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate, he says. And then he says it again in verse number 15. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Now, that's strong words coming from Jesus. Jesus says in verse 6, I hate their deeds. And in verse 15, he says, I hate their doctrine. I hate the works that they're doing, and I hate the doctrine that they're propagating. In Revelation 2, 6, Jesus did not say, I hate the Nicolaitans personally. No. Jesus said he hates the deeds. You know, God loves a sinner, but hates the sin. And unless that sin is repented of, that person will die in their sin and go to hell for the rest of eternity. Jesus said he hates the deeds of this antinomian group, believing they were released by grace from obligation to the moral law. And again, Jesus said in Revelation uh, 2.15 that he also hates their doctrine. In verse 6, again, he says, I hate their deeds. I hate their wicked works because they hid their wicked deeds and their wicked works under the guise of Christianity. But in verse 15, Jesus said, I hate their doctrine. They cloaked, listen, folks, they cloaked everything, all of their evil deeds and all of their evil doctrine. They cloaked everything under the guise of Christianity, deceiving many that were out there. Listen, we have more immoral deeds going on in mainline churches today than you have in the world. There are doctrines of demons, doctrines of devils being propagated in the church than you actually have Bible doctrine. Convictions are being thrown out the window. Bible doctrines being thrown out the window. The word of God is being second guessed. It's being looked at subjectively rather than objectively. And we wonder why, ladies and gentlemen. We wonder why we're not experiencing the power of God in our churches anymore. We wonder why that we have such low attendance in our church today. And listen, there are some good, solid Bible-believing churches out there that are teaching good doctrine that have low attendance. I'm not saying that, well, because, you know, you're teaching solid doctrine, you have a low attendance. That's not, I'm not saying that. You look at all these mega churches that are out there today, you know, I mean, they, I mean, it's like almost standing room only. You know why it's standing room only? Because their flesh is being fed. 
by worldly elements within the church. The 21st century church today is throwing out the baby with the bathwater. The church today has become so desensitized to sin that it no longer bothers them anymore. We have more world in the church as we have in the world itself. And do you think it's going to get any better? No, I think, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to get worse. So why this decline of biblical doctrine in the church? Why are we taking the Bible for its plain sense interpretation anymore? Why are we becoming desensitized to sin? You know, are, are we offended when one is preaching on the doctrine of hell? We're not even preaching on hell anymore in our churches. We're not even preaching on repentance anymore in our churches. We don't even preach on the wrath of God anymore in our churches because it's a very offensive subject. We don't want to offend the people, especially those big tithers that are out there. Whatever happened to the doctrine of the rapture, why are all of these major biblical doctrines being thrown out of the church? Why aren't we preaching on these doctrines anymore. I got a, a magazine in the mail from the uh, Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry and a title on the front cover of that magazine said this, whatever happened to the doctrine of the rapture. That's the reason why I just finished my fifth book. It's my brand new book, Looking for the Promise of the Blessed Hope. Why you can still believe in the doctrine of the rapture because in the church today, Christians no longer believe in the doctrine of the rapture anymore. And the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture is widely attacked in the church today. Why aren't we preaching on hell anymore? Why aren't we preaching on the rapture anymore? Why aren't we preaching on the wrath of God anymore? Why aren't we preaching on repentance anymore? Answer, the emergent church the emergent church. The emergent church is a growing problem among mainline evangelical Christianity today. The emergent church, ladies and gentlemen, has penetrated churches all over the United States. And yes, even some independent fundamental Baptist churches. It was about maybe three or four years ago when I was doing a prophecy conference at my home church, the Greater Rhode Island Baptist Temple in Johnston. And we had other churches come out, non-denominational, whatever, other denominations. After the service, I had one guy approach me very upset. I thought maybe I said something that, you know, irked him. So he came up to me, his eyes were watering a little bit, I knew something wasn't right. And he said, uh, Brother August, he said, um, I came to this conference because the Lord was drawing me to come here. And I'm so glad that I came. Because you briefly touched on something that I am having a problem with right now. I said, what was that? He says, you briefly mentioned the dangers of the emergent church. I said, yes. He said, well, I was just thrown. And this guy was a member of a Nazarene church. And he said, uh, August, he said, I was just thrown out of my home church. And he gave me the name of the church. And he said, I've been a member of this Nazarene church for almost 20-something years. I've been faithful to that church. I've done so much in that church. And I'm trying to pat myself on the shoulder. I've just been so involved and so entrenched in that church. The church decided to move emergent. They wanted to be a part of the emergent church. I spoke up against this and how dangerous this is and what it would do to our church. They all gathered against me from the pastor on down. 
people who I thought were my dear friends, August, they all gathered against me. And they all unanimously voted to throw me out of the church. Because I was the only one to speak out against the dangers of the emerging church. He says, you can see I'm visibly upset. He says, I, he says August, I, I just couldn't stop crying. And when I found out that, that your church was having this prophecy conference, I decided to go, not knowing what you're going to be talking about. And then you, you briefly hit on the dangers of the emerging church. He says, pray for me, August, that God would lead me somewhere to a good Solid Bible-believing church. It says, hey, look no further, man. Come to grip it. <laughs> you, you know? And uh, he says, I'm going to be praying about that. Now, I never never saw the guy again. But he was visibly upset. And he's not the only one. There are many like him who have spoken out against the dangers of the emerging church. And because they spoke out, they were thrown out of their church. Emerging or emerging churches or the emergent church. It takes its name from the idea that as the culture changes, the church should change as well to conform to that very culture. That's pretty much what emergent or emergent means. As the culture changes, the church should change as well and conform to that very culture. In other words, a new church should respond to that very changing culture. The church needs to be conformed to that culture. Well, that reminds me of what T.D. Jake said a couple of years ago. And what she said, you know, the 21st century church today needs to come out of the stone ages. We need to loosen up. And we need to embrace same-sex relationships and embrace these individuals as our brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's time we come out of the stone ages. Hey, let me tell you something. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 tells you and I, to keep the old paths. Listen, Jesus Christ is what? The same. He doesn't change with culture. God's word doesn't change with culture. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's Hebrews chapter 13, and verse number 8. So that's what emergent or emergent simply means. It means as the culture changes, the church changes as well to conform to that culture. Let me tell you something. Paul the Apostle warned about being conformed to the world. And it's contradicting God's word. The change of culture today is in stark contradiction to the word of God. Remember what Paul said in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2? He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be ye not transformed by this world, but uh, uh, be conformed by this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are not to be conformed or molded into this world. Paul says, our minds are to be renewed daily by the word of God. The emergent church says, as the culture changes, then we must change with the culture. That means doctrine must change, standards must change, music must change, the element in the church. All of that needs to change in order to conform with the culture. That's not what the Bible teaches, ladies and gentlemen. Paul says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You do that with the word of God. What did John say in 1 John 2, 15 through 17? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
He says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of this world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. The emerging church says, well, we need to emerge. We need to conform as the culture conforms. That's why they call themselves emergent or emergent. They want to change with the times. Yet the Bible in Romans 12, 2, 1 John 2, 15 through 17, James 4, 4, warns against that very attitude. And ladies and gentlemen, this is the major problem that we're having in the world today. Well, we want to see our church grow. We want to have a mega church like these other guys have on TV today. So in order to do that, we must change with the culture. So that means our music must change. Let's have a rock and roll type atmosphere in the church with, with uh, concert lights of all different colors and smoke and, you know, and all these other things. We need to conform, guys. We need to, we need to change with the culture. Forget this preaching on hell. Forget this Bible doctrine. Forget preaching on the wrath of God. We must conform. The Bible warns against that, ladies and gentlemen. Now listen, when you think of postmodernism, what do you think of? When you think of postmodernism, you think of a dissolving of cold, hard biblical facts in favor, in favor of having this fuzzy, warm subjectivism. That's what you do. You replace biblical convictions. You replace biblical cold, hard facts with personal experience. Subjectivism. Warm, fuzzy feeling, or as the Mormon cult would say, that burden in the bosom. Well, that's right from the pits of hell. That, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. That is how you would describe the emergent church today, by today's standard. According to the emergent church, this, now this is them, according to the emergent church, the Bible should not be read objectively, but subjectively. It should be open to debate, open to discussion. It should be second guessed. It should be taken subjectively, not objectively. And they say it should not be taken literally. We should not take the Bible literally. Now, God is a God of love, and he's not a God of wrath. Well, they need to read Nahum chapter 1 that describes the two natures of God. That he is a God of love, but he is also a God of wrath. You can't have one, ladies and gentlemen, without the other. They say that, you know, God is nothing but a big cosmic teddy bear who wouldn't even hurt a fly, never mind allow somebody to go to hell. So we shouldn't take any of this God wrath stuff literally. That just simply means the wrath of God that God gets upset from time to time, but he'll wink at your sin. And there's a universal salvation which means everybody is going to heaven no matter what religion you are, no matter what your belief system is, no matter what your lifestyle is. Universal salvation. Everybody is going to heaven. doesn't matter if you're an atheist, agnostic. doesn't matter if you're a sodomite. It doesn't matter who you are. God is a big cosmic teddy bear who won't hurt a fly. So you live the way you want to live. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is relative. Your absolute truth is what you want it to be, not what 
the scriptures say it is. And that's a problem, ladies and gentlemen, with the emergent church. Truth is relative. Again, according to the emergent church, in order to complement today's culture, it is experience over reason. Uh, it's uh, being subjective over objective. It's personal feelings, personal experience over truth. It's inclusive over exclusive. This is a very liberal view, ladies and gentlemen. Very extreme liberal view of the Word of God. For those involved in the emergent church movement, as I said already, to them, hey man, listen, truth is relative. Now, when you have somebody come up to you and say, there's no such thing as absolute truth, truth is relative. Let me tell you something. A red flag ought to go off in your head. And we've got many in the church today. In the church today. And my friend Dr. Todd Baker just recently confronted somebody in his congregation who said, well, that's just relative. You know, I mean, it, it's more complicated than that. Whenever, whenever someone says it's more complicated than that, truth is relative. There's no such thing as absolute truth. A red flag ought to go off in your head concerning that individual. Relativism, ladies and gentlemen, will open up all kinds of problems for your church and destroys the standards of the Bible as absolute truth. To them, the Bible is not our source of absolute truth. And those that are involved in the emergent church movement will tell you exactly that. The emergent church also centers on another very dangerous trend going on in the church today. And what is that? Ecumenism. Ecumenism. To the emergent church, there must be unity among all religions. There must be an acceptance of all religions and an acceptance of religious doctrines without offending anyone. All is accepted. There's a universal salvation. All is going to heaven. God's a big cosmic teddy bear. He's not going to throw anybody or allow anybody to go to hell. Let me tell you something. If you see your church moving toward the direction of the emergent church movement, you speak out against it, and you try to stop it, and if they're still going forward with that, you need to get out. You need, ladies and gentlemen, to run to the hills. Therefore, Jesus warned the church at Pergamos about false teachers, bringing in the doctrines of Balaam, Misusing grace to indulge in sinful activity. Bringing in a false doctrine. Being antinomian. Well, then I direct your attention to the church at Thyatira. Notice the message that Jesus had to the church at Thyatira. Verse 20. Revelation 2.20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, or literally a sick bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. What was the problem with the church at Thyatira? Well, we know the problem with the church at Pergamos is they, they were allowing Nicolaitan doctrine to come in. Their wicked deeds and their doctrines to penetrate the church. 
They were antinomian. They were using grace as a license to sin. The problem with the church of Thyatira is that they were allowing a Jezebel spirit into the church. In other words, the church was being dominated by female teachers. Dominated by female quote-unquote pastors. And let me tell you something right now. The Bible never endorses female pastors. And I can prove that straight up through the word of God in 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Nowhere in the scriptures does it endorse female pastors. But yet the church of Thyatira was being dominated by female teachers. And Jesus had a problem with that. There was a dark doctrine, a Jezebel spirit penetrated that church and jesus said if you don't repent i'm casting you into a sick bed and i will kill her children her followers with death listen jesus isn't messing around here ladies and gentlemen that's very strong language i will kill her children her followers with death that's strong language coming from the lord therefore jesus warned the church at pergamos of false teachers, as well as Thyatira, bringing in the doctrine of Balaam, using grace as a license to sin, bringing in false doctrine, being libertine, antinomian. And ladies and gentlemen, that's a problem we have in the church today. We have become desensitized to sin. Again, out of the seven churches in Asia Minor, Jesus only commends Two, just two. Church at Smyrna, the persecuted church. In Philadelphia, the spiritually alive church. The other five churches, Jesus has harsh words for them. Why? Because there were wolves in the church. Whether they were behind the pulpit, on the deacon board, wherever. There were wolves in sheep's clothing. You know what Jesus said to all seven of these churches? This is what he said to all seven of these churches. You ready? I know thy works. Did he not say that to the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2.2? 2, 2? I know thy works. Smyrna, Revelation 2.9? I know thy works. Pergamus, Revelation 2.13? I know thy works. Thyatira, Revelation 2.19? I know thy works. Sardis, Revelation 3, 1, I know thy works. Philadelphia, Revelation 3, 8, I know thy works. Laodicea, Revelation 3, 15, I know thy works. I read that so many times I got it locked in here. Out of all those churches, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works, I know thy works. He said that to all seven of those churches. Second Chronicles 69 tells us the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Do you think you can hide your sin? From God and think you're going to get away with it one day ain't going to happen out of those seven churches Jesus commends two the other five he has very harsh words for them and he says I know thy works Jesus warned of these individuals he said they are wolves in sheep's clothing and um, Matthew chapter Seven verses 15 and 16 he says beware of wolves who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly inwardly he says they are raving wolves what did Paul say in Acts chapter 20 verse 29 Paul said the moment I depart the moment I leave he says grievous wolves savage wolves will come in and not spare the flock and ladies and gentlemen we have wolves today behind the pulpits of America they're dressed in sheep's clothing oh they look nice in their suits their neckties they'll even say I graduated from this school I have a, a degree here I have a degree there 
but their doctrine is right from the pits of hell. You don't think for a moment that Satan has his ministers behind the pulpits of America today? I guarantee you he has his ministers behind the pulpits of America today. I direct your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. For such are false apostles. we got many today who say, I'm an apostle. Not according to Acts chapter 1. In order for you to qualify as an apostle, that means you have to have been an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hello, there are no eyewitnesses today. That means you're not an apostle. Or you go on these hyper-charismatic uh, Christian TV shows today, I'm apostle so-and-so. I'm prophet so-and-so. There are no modern-day prophets today. There are no modern-day apostles today. In order for you to qualify as a prophet, that means you must have been in the Old Testament dispensation and you heard audibly, like you hear my voice now, you hear audibly uh, from the voice of God. That's not going on today. We're not under the Old Testament dispensation today. No one audibly hears the voice of God today. Today, you are not a prophet. And you are definitely not an apostle. The apostolic age ended in the first century A.D. But let me go on. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. They're all over Christian TV. They're in the churches today. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel or don't be surprised. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. They look like a Christian. They act like a Christian. They smell like a Christian. But deep down, they're a twofold child of hell. Paul said in Acts 20, 29, the moment I leave, guys, I know what's going to happen. I can see it coming. The wolves are coming in. The savage wolves are coming in. And they're not going to spare the flock. And ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what the emergent church is doing today. That is exactly what the emergent church is doing today. They come in and they don't spare the flock. And listen, you speak out against them, like they did with that guy who approached me at my church a few years back, they will throw you out. Get rid of the Bible, get rid of the pews, replace the pews with round Italian tables with little warm glowing candles on it, have a nice little cappuccino coffee thing in the sanctuary, a coffee dispenser, replace the pulpit with couches, lounge chairs, have a rock style type setting concert stage up on your pulpit. I've seen those churches up close and personal, man. Not that I attended them, but I noticed that there was one church that was an emergent church. They weren't having services, but I walked in just to see it was empty. Nothing was going on. I think they had like a clothing sale or something going on there. Walked in, and I, I thought I was walking into the Dunkin' Donuts Center, man. You know, where, I mean, there were the, the drum sets, and there were... Um, Lights and fog, they had fog machines. And I said, bingo, emergent church. I saw round Italian coffee tables, coffee dispensers. It, I mean, they threw out the baby with the bathwater. Why? Emergent. Emergent. As the culture changes, you as a church change with the culture which means your standards change, your doctrine changes, your attitude toward holiness changes. So not only do we see postmodernism through the emergent church destroying our churches today, but we even have, you ready for this? The postmodern prophetic paradigm. What is that? These guys are teaching science fiction eschatology. Paradigm simply means a model. It's a new model of 
philosophical eschatology, not biblical eschatology, philosophical eschatology. In other words, you go beyond the Bible, you go beyond scripture to get your sources that you think is another source of absolute truth. This postmodern prophetic paradigm embraces UFO eschatology, Nephilim eschatology, that, that demons in human flesh are walking among us today. You might even have them as a cousin or brother or a co-worker. It's nonsense, ladies and gentlemen. Like the emergent church, with the postmodern prophetic paradigm, there are no such things as absolute. There are many sources of absolute truth. It's not just limited to the Bible. There are many sources of absolute truth, not just the word of God. You can get your ideas through numerous sources, whether it's humanism, whether it's philosophy. There are many sources of absolute truth. It's not just limited to the word of God, the Bible. That is an emergent church. That is postmodernism. That is the postmodern prophetic paradigm. There are many sources of relative truth. The Bible should not be looked at objectively only. You've got to second guess what's in this book, man. Why? As the culture changes, we must change. Emergent. Emergent. That is postmodernism postmodern prophetic paradigm. Both growing problems in the church today. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe this is set in the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. I believe this is set in the stage for the one world religion of Revelation chapter 17. The one world religion will be in cahoots with the world ruler of the revived Roman Empire in Revelation chapter 13. You have a one world religion that was born out of Genesis chapter 11 with Nimrod's Tower of Babel. And the revived Roman Empire described in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 12, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 17. For a future revived Roman Empire. The little horn coming out of the revived Roman Empire in Daniel 7, 8. The little horn is the ruler of the revived Roman Empire, the Antichrist. Both this false religion of Revelation 17 and the ruler of the revived Roman Empire, the Antichrist, will work in harmony in the upcoming Daniel's 70th week of prophecy, the future seven-year period of tribulation to come. The false church is known in Revelation 17, 5 as, and it's all in block letters. God wants you to see who he's talking about. Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. I saw her up close and personal, Dr. Todd Baker, two years ago when we were in Rome, teaching in front of the Vatican on the false church of Revelation 17. And we were harassed by uniformed Vatican police officers who told us we couldn't teach that book there because they don't believe the Bible to be the word of God. They told us that straight up. That they don't believe the Bible to be the word of God and we could not teach that there. That didn't stop us because we took our video camera, we went outside the fence, of St. Peter's Square, now we're back in Rome, even though the Vatican is technically in Rome, but yet when you're on their property, you're in a whole different country, a whole different nation. But when we went outside of that fence, we're back in Rome, and we started teaching out of Revelation 17 on the false church with the Vatican in the background. They couldn't touch us with a 10-foot pole. You have the Italian police that were watching us. They didn't do nothing. It was the Vatican police. That if looks could have killed, Todd Baker and I would have been dead that day, or they would have thrown us in jail. I noticed one of them had their hand on their gun as they're talking to us. 
one of them had their hands on their handcuffs. They hate the word of God. The false religion, the one world religion of Revelation 17. She's mystery, Babylon the Great. In Revelation 17, she's called a woman six times, and she's called a whore three times. In Revelation 17, in verse number three, she rides on the coattails of the Antichrist. And because of that, this false religion is catapulted to global dominance under the Antichrist. But when the Antichrist has everything that he wants, he will destroy that false church based on Revelation 17, 16, and 17. And we know that at his second coming, Jesus will return in Revelation 19, 11, at the end of the tribulation period. And he will destroy the revival of an empire. He will destroy the beast and the false prophet in Revelation 19, 19, and 20. Cast them into the lake of fire. Satan is bound in the bottomless pit for that 1,000 years. And at the end of the 1,000 years, he'll be cast into the lake of fire according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse number 10. Listen, folks. The word of God is not only absolute truth. Jesus said that in Revelation uh, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. That's absolute, ladies and gentlemen. But not only is the word of God, the Bible, absolute truth, and it should be read objectively. God's son is also called the word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1. 1 John 1.1, 1, 1. and Revelation 19. And verse number 13, Jesus is the word who is from the beginning. Jesus is the embodiment of all truth. And his name is called the word of God. So in closing, if you know anyone involved in an emergent church, tell them to get out immediately. Immediately. Run to the hills, man. Any one church that undermines the authority of the word of God and says we shouldn't look at it objectively. There's no such thing as absolute truth. Truth is relative. It's more complicated than that. You need to get out of that church. Anyone who undermines the word of God, you need to get out of that church. Find another church. The last day scenario of this false teaching coming from the emergent church and others like them, postmodernism, the postmodern prophetic paradigm, all of these guys are set in the stage for Bible prophecy to be fulfilled. And one day rolling out the red carpet for the one world religion of Revelation chapter number 17. I believe, ladies and gentlemen, the stage is set. The actors are getting into position. And the curtain is about to go up on the end time drama. Jesus is coming soon. The next main event on God's calendar of events is indeed the rapture of the church of the living God. Dr. Todd Baker, who I'll be going to Israel with next month, says, those who denigrate and deny the blessed hope of the rapture are satanically robbing believers of this wonderful assurance. And Todd, that's the reason why I wrote this new book, Looking for the Promise of the Blessed Hope, Why You Can't Still Believe in the Doctrine of the Rapture. Because those guys in the EC movement, no rapture, that's just a fairy tale. Upcoming tribulation period, that's just a fairy tale. Second coming, all this stuff, all fairy tales. We need to live for the here and now. Remember, we must change with the culture, which means our doctrine, our attitude, our biblical convictions must also change with the culture. No. Hebrews 13.8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, 
today. Let me just let me just end with this, and I'm, I'm gonna close. Jeremiah six sixteen. Go there with me quickly. Jeremiah six sixteen. Jeremiah six sixteen says this, and I think this is something we need to be taking heed to. Jeremiah six sixteen. Thus saith the Lord: Stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. That's what Jesus said in Matthew eleven thirty. And ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Well, what was the attitude of those in Jeremiah's day? When Jeremiah asked them to walk in the old paths, here's what they said. We will not walk therein. We won't walk therein. We refuse to walk therein. We don't want the old paths. Or as T.D. Jake says, we need to come out of the stone ages. We need to conform to the culture. That's what emergent means. Emergent. Emergent church. Avoid it. Pass by it. Don't touch it. Get out of it. Find a good, local, independent, fundamental, Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church where the word of God is preached, where the word of God is read objectively, where they have a passion for wooden souls. You need a good Philadelphia-style Bible-believing church. And if you're looking for a church, if you, you, if you think you're involved in an emerging church, let me know. I want to direct you, no matter where you live in the United States, I want to direct you to a good, local, solid, Bible-believing church gospel preaching church and if you don't know the lord jesus as your personal savior i'd love to talk with you i'd love to show you from the word of god how you can know for sure without a shadow of a doubt that one day heaven will be your home i'd love to share that with you contact me through facebook messenger through my website today in bible prophecy .org. my email august dot today in bible prophecy at gmail dot com Kathy Bogan says, I, I, I do not understand how people can second guess God, how they can second guess God. He is everywhere you look. The miracles of healing, the beauty of his creations, the, the beautiful sun, moon stars, the beauty of life, which is a miracle. Yeah, only God can do the miracles, not man. Only God can do the miracles. Only God can do the healing. Ask yourself this question for these, these so-called faith healers on Christian TV. Think about this with me for a moment. The reason why you don't see faith healers putting the hospitals out of business is the same reason why you don't see psychics winning the lottery. You want, let that sink down for a moment, okay? Ponder on what I just told you. Chew on that for a few moments. We need to let the word of God be our final authority. So I hope this lesson was a blessing to you. If you have questions, I'd love to hear from you, and uh, you can put them in the comment box there. But I hope you join me tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget to visit me on the social networks here on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Twitter, and on LinkedIn. You can look at me, follow me on the four social networks. Again, Todd Baker and I are leaving for Israel. Next month, March 11th through the 20th, I need you to pray for us as we're out there sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. We'll also be teaching Bible prophecy. It's going to be my 20th trip out there to Israel. And we need your prayers that God will open the doors for us to share the good news of the gospel. Your prayers I need, we need, we covet. But we also need, ladies and gentlemen, your financial support. It's imperative that we have your financial support for the car rental, and for gas expense to get us around the Holy Land, to the north, south, central, to get the word of God to the Jewish people. And your financial support would help us to do that. It's like you're there in Israel with us, sharing the gospel. And God will bless you and credit that to your heavenly account. 
And so if you can help us out with that, that would be greatly appreciated. No gift too big, no gift too small. Go to my website, todayinbibleprophecy.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page. Hit the donate button. Put whatever amount the Lord lays on your heart. You can also mail your support to Today in Bible Prophecy Ministries, 55 Pleasant Street, Apartment 2, Lincoln, Rhode Island, 02865. If you're interested in joining me in Israel for a prophecy tour, June 6th through the 16th this year, I want to take between 15 or 18 people, come and join us with an option to Petra. If you want to come to Israel with us, let me know. We take small groups, and I'm going to teach you Bible prophecy on location. We have a very cheap price, very inexpensive price. And so if you want more information, contact me. I'll let you know exactly what you need to do. If you're a pastor of a solid, independent, fundamental Bible-believing church, and you would like to have me come to your church to preach on Israel, Bible prophecy, and current events, just contact me. And let's set up a date. I would love to come to your church. Speaking of that, this Sunday, I'll be preaching in Millbury, Massachusetts at God, God's Grace Bible Church. They're an independent fundamental Baptist church, God's Grace Bible Church in Millbury, Massachusetts. Bob Picard is the pastor. I preached for them already. Great church. And uh, they're in the historical part of Millbury. And I'm going to be there at, at God's Grace Bible Church this upcoming Sunday. So if you live in Millbury, Massachusetts, or any of the surrounding areas, come on out and join us as I preach on Bible prophecy. And uh, go to my website, sign up for my newsletters. They go out every single week. Navigate around the website and look for my brand new book that's coming out possibly by mid-March. That's the date we're looking at, mid-March, my fifth book. Looking for the promise of the blessed hope. Why you can still believe in the doctrine of the rapture. And the pre-tribulation doctrine of the rapture. It just went to the publishers. They had to send it back to me. I had to, there's a few things I needed to tweak out there. Thanks to my wife, Patty. And she was up. She was doing it yesterday. And then she was up at like 6.30 this morning. 5.30 this morning. 5.30 this morning. You know, just tweaking it, getting everything ready, proofreading, all that good stuff. And so we sent it back uh, to the publishers, and we think it's gonna everything's gonna go through. And uh, I'm hoping that by mid-March that book would be available. We're taking pre-orders for that book. I will personally autograph the book to you, and you can pre-order the book. It's not up on my website yet, but it will be today. You can pre-order that book. I go to the website, todaybibleprophecy.org. Again, go down to the donate button. Hit the donate button. And just put Blessed Hope Book. That's all you need to do. Blessed Hope Book. The shipping will be $3. So uh, $18 altogether. And once we receive your pre-order, once the books come in mid-March, we'll make sure that we get that brand new book out to you. It's going to run maybe about $100. 132 pages or so. And I hope and pray that this book will be a blessing to you and why you can still believe in the doctrine of the rapture, even though, once again, that doctrine is being thrown out the window by many churches today. Why you can still believe in the doctrine of the rapture. I hope and pray this book will be a blessing to you. And so you can pre-order that book, and I hope that you do that as soon as possible, so that way you can reserve your book. All right, guys, that's all the time that we have today. Don't forget, join us tomorrow at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So remember, keep looking up. Jesus is coming soon. And Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray the peace of Jerusalem. And we will talk to you, Lord willing, tomorrow. God bless, guys. Take care. Have a wonderful day in the Lord.